Friends, welcome to this recorded service from North Kelowna United Church. We gather today to create the service for March 27th, the fourth Sunday in Lent. Participating in today's service is Joanne, our musician, Betty, our reader, Gay, our candlelighter, Donna and Gay and Betty assisting in leading the responses, Wilma, our videographer, Heinz, our sound technician, and I'm Reverend Don Johnson, minister of the congregation. Today's service concludes two years of recording our weekly services. We encourage you to attend North Kelowna United Church on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. And we thank all those who in the past two years have participated in creating these recordings. This day and for the days to come, we keep in our hearts and in our prayers the people of Ukraine in this their time of loss and grief. As we begin, we acknowledge that we meet in Treaty One land, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Dakota peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We are thankful for these first inhabitants, and we commit to working together towards justice, truth, and reconciliation. We move now to the lighting of the Christ candle. In the light of Christ, rising in glory, banish all darkness from our hearts and minds. Amen. worship God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray together. Gracious God, seeker of the lost, draw your children back to your loving embrace. Restore us to our inheritance as daughters and sons and reconcile our hearts to you, that we may become ambassadors of your reconciling love to all the world. Through Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Our scripture readings this morning, the fourth Sunday in Lent, are from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 to 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we no longer know him in that way. So, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. 
we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Our response of reading is Psalm 32. Blessed are those whose offenses are forgiven, whose sin has been put away. Blessed are those to whom God imputes no guilt, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silence, my body wasted away, while I groaned all the day long. For your hand was heavy upon me, day and night. My strength dried up as in a summer drought. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. My guilt I did not hide. I said, I will confess my sins to God, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you in time of trouble. When the great flood water rises, we shall not come near them. You are a hiding place for me. You will preserve me from trouble. You will surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will teach you and guide you in the way you should go. I will keep you under my eye and instruct you. Be not like a horse or mule without understanding. Whose horse must be checked with a bit and bridle. Many pains are in store for the wicked. But whoever trusts in God is surrounded by steadfast love. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. The Gospel this day is written in the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far away, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost 
and his found. And they began to celebrate. Now the elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured his property, your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that, my, all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So begins the parable of the prodigal son, as it is commonly called, although it could also be known as the parable of the lost son. That's because this chapter from Luke's Gospel contains three parables about being lost and found. The first parable is about a lost sheep, the one who has wandered away and is diligently sought after by the shepherd. The other 99 sheep are left alone while the lost one is found, returning on the shoulders of the shepherd. Henry Williams Baker captures so well the depth of emotion of that parable in his paraphrase of the 23rd Psalm. The king of love. Perverse and foolish oft I strayed, but yet in love he sought me, and on his shoulder gently laid, and home rejoicing brought me. All six verses of that hymn are wonderful poetry, rich in imagery and very lyrical. In a previous pastoral charge I served, I well remember visiting an elderly woman in the hospital. Her illness was quite advanced, but she kept her spirits up as she was a woman of deep faith. As we talked, the subject of hymns came up, and she asked me which was my favorite. I tur it turned out that both of us held the King of Love as a favorite hymn. So we began to recite it together. The King of Love my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. We continue to say all six verses from memory, ending with, And so through all the length of days, thy goodness faileth never. Good shepherd, may I sing my praise within thy house forever. Within a week, she had passed away, trusting in the Good Shepherd to lead her to God's eternal home. The second parable tells of a woman who has lost a coin, a single coin perhaps of no great value, yet she turns her house upside down until she finds it. And in finding it, she then calls her friends and neighbors to rejoice with her. Both of these actions, the shepherd risking the whole flock for one lost sheep, and the woman searching for the lost coin, might be seen as a bit excessive. But then, 
These are parables. They're not lessons in animal husbandry or domestic economics. They're pointing to something deeper, to the joy of the lost being found, to the wanderer coming to their senses and returning or being returned to the fold. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance, is the conclusion of the lost sheep parable. Brendan Byrne writes in his commentary entitled The Hospitality of God, heaven, that is God and the entire heavenly court, rejoices over one sinner who repents more than over 99 who have no need of repentance. Why? Because God is crazy with love over each individual human being and rejoices exuberantly over finding one that has been lost in the death that is sin. Jesus' celebration of joyful meals with repent with repentant sinners simply enacts on earth that exuberant heavenly joy. At stake, then, is the image Jesus' critics have of God. Finally, we have the third parable, the one we heard this morning, of the two sons and the father. This is supremely a parable that speaks of the amazing, passionate, forgiving love of God that God has for each of us. In this parable, the father never gives up on his wayward son, never stops scanning the horizon for some indication that his son has come to his senses and is returning home. As Luke puts it so beautifully, but while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. John Newton echoes the emotion of this passage so well. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. One can only imagine the, the bewilderment, relief, and joy of the prodigal being welcomed home so lovingly. And what of the other son, the loyal, faithful, never caused anyone any bother son, the one who kept the farm going while his brother lived the high life in the city? This is no happy day for him, and he is scandalized at the excess of the celebration. After all, he never got a fatted calf to help celebrate with his friends, never even got a young goat. He never asked for anything, yet this younger brother, this embarrassment of the family name, asked for everything including his share of the inheritance, which he wasted away in no time. And now the family are celebrating this guy's return. Hardly fair, certainly not just. No wonder the older brother is angry. All the father can say in response to this expressed anger is this. Son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost 
and it's been found. If we were in a study group instead of a worship service, what thoughts might come to mind about this parable? What do you think of the younger son who squanders his inheritance and after some truly rough living returns home seeking forgiveness? What do you think of the dutiful older son, the faithful one who stayed on the farm and seems to have never had any fun? And what do you make of the father, the one who gave the younger son his inheritance yet never stopped loving and looking for his wayward son. We began today's Gospel reading this way. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. The Gospels tell us that the religious authorities of the day were quick to find fault with Jesus. Sure, so sure, that he was misleading the people and encouraging them to abandon their customs and practices. This Jesus seemed to reject the rules, and he clearly didn't know what kind of company to keep. Respectable people don't associate with sinners, let alone share in meals with them. Yet Jesus did, and he welcomed the opportunity. Perhaps Jesus had the Pharisees and scribes and others of their ilk in mind when he described the attitude of the older son. You know, people for whom the observance of the law was more important than the realities the occasional victories, the, the happy events of ordinary life. People who cannot see the joyous occasion it is when the lost are found, or when those who have gone their own way repent and return to the family of God. This parable is all about extravagance, the extravagant love of God as portrayed in the Father who spares no expense to celebrate his love for his son, for the return of the lost son to the family. Back in my seminary days, one of our professors said that he believed that whenever we profess our belief in God, God's heart is touched. He said, whenever we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. The heart of God skips a beat, as it were. Such is the love, the passion God has for creation and for all of us within creation. In his commentary on this passage, Tom Wright offers this, and, and I'm going to end the sermon with it, and I believe this is worth he begins by saying, we just had to have a party. Then he continues, that's the main point of the story. Jesus had been challenged about the parties he was having and the company he was keeping at them. And he responded with this spectacular story. Let's go to one of those parties and see what it was all about. We sneak in at the back and find things already in full flow. A bit of a rough crowd, it seems. The sort of people you'd probably avoid in the street. Some of them scruffy, some of them a bit too suspiciously well-dressed. How could they afford clothes like that? Somebody's obviously been hard at work cooking because there are delicious smells coming from a back room and people keep emerging from the kitchen with more dishes. And there are flagons of wine and everyone is helping themselves. And in the middle of it all, we spot Jesus himself, relaxed and easy, reclining as people did on a couch beside the table chatting to the man beside him, occasionally flashing a smile at the serving girls bringing more food, or waving to a newcomer 
who's heard there's a party and has pushed his way in. Occasionally we hear snatches of what Jesus is saying. Something about the, the first being last and the last first. The man he's talking to looks surprised. He wants to believe it, but isn't yet sure he can. But at the back of the crowd, where we are standing, there are other voices. What on earth is he up to now? Isn't he supposed to be a prophet? Isn't he telling people about God's kingdom? Doesn't that mean being holy, not messing around with the rabble? And he's teaching people to call God Father. Doesn't he know that sons are supposed to obey father's commandments? He's just a glutton and a drunkard like them. And the Bible warned us about teachers like that. Eventually, Jesus looks up and glances around the room towards the whisperers. The talking dies down as people wait to see what he's going to say. All right. You want to know why there's a party? You want to know how it is with fathers and sons? And out it comes. A masterpiece, one of the greatest stories ever told, echoing the ancient stories of those other ill-starred brothers, Cain and Abel, Ishmael and Isaac, and particularly Esau and Jacob. The son who runs away in trouble and comes back to find resentment. But all with a new twist. Something new is going on right here, right now. And a party is the only possible response. Resurrection is happening right under your noses. And you can't see it. This, my son, this, your brother, who is dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. 
for the church throughout the world, that all Christians may embody the reconciling love of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For the nations of the world and its leaders, that all may dwell in peace and that justice may be tempered by mercy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the people of Ukraine in their time of suffering and violence, that swords may be turned into plowshares and the ambitions of cruel leaders be contained. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the planet Earth, God's gift to humankind, that all may share wisely its resources and conserve, conserve its riches for our children's children. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our enemies, that we may regard them with the reconciling love made manifest in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are sick or in trouble, for the defenseless, the weak, and the poor, that they may be restored to wholeness of life and livelihood. For all for whom we now pray in the silence of our hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the lost, for those who have abandoned God, friends, or family, and for those who have never known such love, that they may come to know the joy of love's embrace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Loving God, hear the prayers of your people for the sake of our world and our Savior Jesus Christ, through whom we pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And let us offer together this final prayer for that. Lord, in these days of mercy, make us quiet and prayerful. In these days of challenge, make us stronger than you. In these days of emptiness, take possession of us. In these days of waiting, open our hearts to the mystery of your cross. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen.